Book of Hebrews chapter 1, we're studying Jesus. Who is Jesus? And we're looking at the aspect of him being the son of God. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse, let's start in verse 1. We'll read a few verses. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, that's the that's what we're focusing on uh, last week, tonight, and probably a little bit next week as well. That Jesus, along with being everything else, he is the Son of God. That in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also he made the worlds. And I want you to think about that. Because, well, let me read this before I get into it. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Think about that. How does he uphold all things? By the word of his power. His word. When he had purged himself, when, uh, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And, and we were talking about this during the homecoming because we were trying to show the idea in Revelation 10 that Jesus, I believe, is that mighty angel that comes down from heaven, but he's not to be reckoned as the other angels that are in heaven. He is not one of them. He is altogether different than they are. And that's what he's saying in verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him and of the angels he saith who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire but i want you to look at verse 8 but unto the son he saith thy throne o god is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom heavenly father we ask your blessings on our study of your word tonight pray dear god that you would um, make your word clear to us Help us to learn what we can. Help us to believe what we can. And then the things that we have seen and learned, help us, dear God, to commit that to faithful men as well. We ask your blessings on your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. I've got it in my mind um, for tomorrow's message uh, to preach a little bit about uh, Sister Bernice as, as sort of like a cornerstone. The book of Psalms talks about thy daughter shall be a polished cornerstone. And her being one of the ones that started this church. When you start a church, you have hope. You have hope that you, uh, in the ministry of that church, can bring, can te make disciples and then bring in new disciples. That you can take young people like I was back then. And train them to be disciples of Jesus Christ, who then in turn can take that generation and train them to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate you guys doing what you did this week, because what you did was you tried to instill what you already believe into your children by showing them, here's, this is not the ark, but here's a facsimile of the ark, this is what we believe, and nobody's going to take that faith away from us. And we want to instill that into a younger generation. Somebody say amen. And that, excuse me, this tie is bothering the daylights out of me for some reason. I must have gained weight this week from homecoming or something like that. But yeah, amen, it was good. But anyway, it's the idea that that generation that started this church years ago had hopes that they could take a young generation and teach them and train them in the ways of Jesus Christ and then turn around and give that to another generation. And uh, that's the legacy of uh, Sister Bernice and Sister Hazel and all of those others. That's what's in my mind tonight. So if I stray away from the message and get lost, that's where I am. I'm trying to think about what I'm saying, what I'm going to say already tomorrow night. And God said, don't do that. So anyway. But anyway, verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is 
forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Here's one of the things that separates Jesus from all of the other angels in heaven. Jesus is not created. He did not have a beginning. He did not have an origin. Can somebody give me a verse very quickly? I like this guy already. Micah, he knows exactly where I'm going. Micah, turn there. Micah 5.2. By the way, Micah is the 33rd book of the Bible. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And notice what it says. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. NIV says, whose origins are from ancient times. He did not have an origin. He did not originate from somewhere. He did not have a beginning. He was the beginning. Amen. So he's all, and this is, this is something you'd be surprised at people who say they believe in Jesus and yet they believe that he had a beginning at some point, maybe in ancient times past, who knows, but he did not have a beginning. He always was, is now, and he always will be. And that's what he's back in Hebrews chapter uh, 1 verse 8 where it says, Unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. When you're dealing with eternity, if something is everlasting and eternal, it doesn't have an origin. It is in time past, time present, time future, Always was, is now, and always shall be. And that's one of the things that sets him aside from the rest of the angels. Now, uh, take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. I was going to get into this a little bit last Wednesday night, ran out of time, so I decided to kind of hold off in a little bit. But I want you to notice something about the devil. The devil... If you ever wonder where your doubts come from, wonder no more. They came from Satan. They came from the father of lies. They came from the one who, when the word of God gets sown into your life, Satan comes immediately, either hardens a part of your heart or tries to disrupt the word or tries to take away from the word or tries to add to the word and so on and so on. So, Jesus did not have an origin, did not have a beginning. The Bible is exactly right. And it's Satan then who's always trying to question, number one, whether or not God's word is true or not. Number two, whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, let's read uh, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was an afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him and said, "It," notice what he's doing. If thou be the son of God. Now, devil, that's kind of stupid. You're talking to the one who made you. You're talking to your creator. You're talking to your judge. If thou be the son of God, right? Uh, command these stones to be made bread. But he, but he answered and said unto him, "Is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now I'm going to throw this in because it's a, I mean, it's a, I've told this story several times, but it, it absolutely fits. And I want you to be reminded of it. Why we believe what we believe. Do you have to believe that Jesus is God? Yes. Do you have to believe that every word in the Bible is true? Absolutely. There was, along with all of these, uh, I, I pulled out the list of charter members this afternoon, was looking at it, looking Sister Bernice's name on there, other names that I knew when I was a little boy here. And there was a, a, a woman that went to church here. Her, she and her husband taught school. Her husband was a high school science teacher. And every pastor that came to pastor the church 
would go and visit this woman's husband because he was one of those that he would never come to church with his wife, didn't believe it. I was at his house with a couple of different pastors and I would hear the pastor try to lead this man to Jesus. He wouldn't, he would not believe it. He was intellectual. I do not believe in things like that and so and so on. Well, when they both retired, they left this area and moved to a different area. And for some reason, I don't know what it was, but for some reason, a different pastor from a different church went to visit this man and he said then he accepted Jesus as his savior. So, and we all heard the news. Oh, great, man, this guy's saved. All right, praise the Lord. After about a year, the pastor of that church, and I know the pastor, he's a good man. Pastor of that church begins to teach a Sunday night series on the creation, sort of like I've been doing. Only probably a lot shorter than what I'm teaching it. But anyway, he's teaching on the creation week. And he teaches the literal interpretation of Genesis chapter 1. The evening and the morning were the first day. And according to the genealogies of the Bible, we trace that back, the lineages and the time frames given to us, we trace that back to roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 years ago was the beginning of the creation. So he teaches that to his church. Church is saying amen. This former retired School teacher is just red as a beet and he's angry. And after church, he literally goes after that pastor and he says, I can't believe you teach something that ignorant. He said, I thought you were a good man. I thought you, I thought you had it really, really had it going. There's no way in the world this universe, this earth, this world is, is less than 6,000 years old. In fact, we know this, and they kind of got into it, and I don't know exactly the exchange of words, but they had an exchange of words. And that man said, I will never believe that, and I will never be back here ever again. And he left that church. And he died a few years after that. It wasn't too long after that that he left this world and stood before his creator. Now, I'm not his judge. And I am not going to tell you, I know where that man is right now. What I am going to tell you is, if you're going to accept part of the Bible as true, it's all or nothing. It is all or nothing. If you can't, if you, if you say, well, I believe that part about salvation. I don't believe that part about creation. I don't believe that part about Noah's flood. I don't believe that part about all that end time stuff. But this one area, this one little section of the Bible sounds pretty good to me. And so I'll buy that. Now, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe as he's a new Christian, maybe he needs to learn more. Maybe, maybe had he been around longer, maybe God would eventually change. I don't know. And so I'm not saying that this man, I know this man's in heaven or I know this man's in hell. What I'm saying to you is, let God be true and every man a liar. That means me, you, wherein we stray from what is written in the word of God. If I say, thus saith the Lord, and I read it verbatim, then I'm right. I know I'm right. Anything else, I wouldn't count on what I said. It's only the word of God. Somebody say amen. And so here's, it's always about, number one, questioning the word of God and questioning who Jesus is. This is Satan. This is what he does. So you can pretty much, if you want to, if you want to learn to spot a cult, a group of people who call, may call themselves Christians or call themselves by the name of Christ, and yet they don't believe What's in the Bible? To me, that's a cult. That's a group of people who say one thing or say they are one thing, but they are not what they say they are. So here's the tempter. We know in Genesis, uh, Genesis 3, the tempter then is tempting Eve by questioning God's word. Well, he's not going to do that necessarily with Jesus. He's going to question his divinity. If you are the son of God, then do, do what I say for you to do. Do a magic trick. Um, 
So he said, uh, uh, if thou be the son of God, uh, turn these stones to bread. Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone. And Jesus is quoting scripture, by the way. Verse 5, then the devil taketh up him, taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, it, here again, it, if thou be the son of God, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Which is why you should not pick up rattlesnakes in church service. Amen. Amen. John, I don't know if you know this, but there are churches in America that pick up rattlesnakes during the church service. To me, you're tempting God. You're tempting God. When, when Jesus said, at the, you know, they, they shall take up servants. He did not command us to go around picking up rattlesnakes. But if something like that happens, God will take care of it. Amen. Uh, there are other ways to tempt God, by the way. One of the ways that I think you can tempt God is to say, I believe God will save me no matter what, so I'm going to go out and perform no matter what. I'm going to go out and I'm going to sin. I'm going to do everything that I want to do. I'm going to commit sin after sin after sin after sin, because after all, God said He would have to forgive me. So that means I can sin all I want to, God must forgive me. To me, that's tempting the Lord thy God. Amen. Amen. But he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But Satan is the one questioning whether or not he is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 26. Turn there. Matthew 26, Matthew chapter 27. We're in that neighborhood. So you have... The devil, and then you have the devil's servants, the religious crowd. And believe it or not, you have Roman Catholic priests who do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. You have Methodist ministers who do not believe that Jesus is God. You, pro you have Presbyterian ministers who do not believe that Jesus is God. You have, by the way, I don't know if you heard what I said yesterday, but in this town, Presbyterian minister, during the church service, announced with his wife and children sobbing on the front row, announced to the world that he's a homosexual and he's leaving his wife and kids and his church and God. And that's just, that's just bad. That's wrong. Okay? But you, have, you actually have ministers in pulpits who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe it. So it doesn't matter if they call themselves Christian. If they don't believe that Jesus is God, that He is God's only begotten Son, not His one and only Son. That's not what the Bible says. This is His only begotten Son. If you don't believe that, that's one of the core principles of what we believe. Matthew 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said to them, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us, whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. For Jesus to say it, because they were going to accuse him of heresy. You're not really the Son of God, are you? Tell us whether or not you're the Son of God. And Jesus is like, well, I'll, I've told you, you just don't want to believe it anyway. Matthew 27, verse 40. Look there. Uh, 
Uh, look at it. Look, pick it up in verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. But I always, who, who wags their heads? Dogs. Dogs do. They wag their heads. And saying, thou that destroys the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. No, you've got it wrong. If he's really the son of God, he'll stay on the cross. Because that's what he was appointed to. Amen. Who was it? The Reverend, the, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon from Korea. Who started the, what the Unification Church, these Moonies we called them here in America. Basically built this humongous cult by saying that Jesus didn't, he failed in what God sent him to do. He failed because he let them kill him on the cross. Saying that Jesus failed. No, he succeeded. Amen. If thou be Jesus come down from the cross. Verse 41, likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. He didn't need to be saved. It was us that needed to be saved. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, here's what you have. You have God himself declaring that Jesus is the son of God. Remember what Peter said? Peter said, we heard the voice there on the mountain. This is my beloved son. You have the Old Testament saying, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You have Jesus himself. And this is repeated then by the high priest who's mocking Jesus, who says, for he said, I am the son of God. And yet for all that, they still wouldn't believe him. And then in, look in verse 54. I like this. When the centurion, now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. God believed it, Jesus believed it, the disciples believed it. Mary Magdalene, who used to have, she was infested with seven devils, she believed it, and I believe it. I believe that, and the Roman soldier, the, the Gentile, this man who probably was one of those that held him down on the cross while they were driving the nails into him, surely this man was the Son of God. And then, uh, John 3, turn there, John 3. Our, our belief about salvation at its core hinges upon the fact that Jesus is not an ordinary, he is neither ordinary angel, nor is he ordinary man, but he is above all of those in that he is God's only begotten son. So John chapter 3, let's look in verse uh, 14. As Moses, and this is Jesus, he's explaining to Nicodemus about being born again. You must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. There must be a new birth. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want you to notice in verse 4, he's referred to as the Son of Man. In, or excuse me, verse 14, he's referred to as the Son of Man. In verse 16, he's referred to as the Son of God. Is that a contradiction? So what percentage then of Jesus was man and what percentage was God? 100 and 100. So you add that up. 
you get infinity. <laughs> okay? He was fully man, and he was fully God. Because he was the son of God. A son of a duck is a duck. Son of God is God. For God so loved the world. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the, uh, notice this, the only begotten Son of God. So the question is, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God in order to be saved? According to that, yes. You're condemned because you won't believe. And, 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 you know, ask the question, because I just read it. Who doesn't believe? Well, the high priest didn't believe. The Pharisees didn't believe. The religious crowd didn't believe. Satan may have pretended he didn't believe. Whether he believed, I don't, it doesn't matter. He doubted whether or not he was the Son of God. All of those who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God... They're already condemned. It requires faith to believe that he is, and listen to this, that he is who he said he was, and who the Bible says he is, and who God says he is. He is the Son of God. Turn to Galatians 4. Something, um, in fact, let me, we just kind of think about this for a minute. Because um, I mentioned cults, certain cults will try to um, reduce Jesus down to something that he's not. Um, do the Mormons believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? What do they believe about him? He's Satan's brother. He is a God. That's exactly right. Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, they can be like him. Okay, as, as here's the Mormon saying, as God is, man will be, and as man is, God once was. That's what they say. It's crazy. Jehovah's Witness. Do they believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? No. They don't. They, they say the title, Son of God, can be applied to him, but he is, he, that still keeps him less than God, but not equal to God. And yet, the Bible says, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay? Um, let's see, who else can we pick on? Um, I don't know where, yes, sir. Right, the Muslims, they, we talked about that last Wednesday night, the Muslims see him as a prophet, but of course they say that Allah had no son, therefore they, they don't believe it. Um, a lot of those who, be careful. You'll hear people say, oh I believe in Yeshua. Be careful. They didn't say Jesus, and they didn't say Jesus for a reason. And most, and I'm not going to say all, but most of your sacred name or your Hebrew roots adherents, they have a, they have a tricky way of trying to define who Jesus is. But I think a lot of them would, would not want to come out and admit that they believe that Jesus absolutely beyond any shadow of a doubt is God. They reduce it somehow, some way. They make him a lesser deity or a lesser entity than God himself. I remember uh, Brother Reg Kelly, was, he was telling this story one time that he had encountered. There was a couple guys, they were Mormon missionaries. And they made the mistake 
of riding up to Reg Kelly. And Reg knew who they were. They didn't know who he was, but he knew. So they started in on their deal. You know, hey, we'd like to talk to you about this, and we'd like to get you our literature. And Reg said, he said, boys, I'll talk to you. Just answer one question. Is Jesus almighty God? And he said, the one that took the lead kind of diverged around that question and talked about it. Reg came back to it. He said, you, you're not answering my question. Is Jesus almighty God? And once again, he diverted, deflected the question and went around it. And finally, Reg said, I answer my question. Is Jesus God almighty? And he, said, he could see that guy getting red face. He says, no, he's not. Red said, I appreciate your honesty, but that's where you're wrong. And Reg went on to quote scripture then. In fact, could you give me scripture? Where it says that Jesus is... Anybody? Turn to Isaiah... Huh? Uh, Isaiah 9. Turn there. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. Underline this in your Bible. Memorize it. Don't memorize it and destroy it. Just memorize it. For unto us a child is born. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of God. Uh, here's another Mormon fallacy. They believe that Jehovah God literally knocked on Mary's door, went into that woman's house, laid in bed with her, and conceived Jesus. That is a lie. He's the virgin born God. For us a child is born unto us upon his shoulder, and it's named. That's different than the government being on our backs. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and his name shall be that's a good one you remember that one all right and name shall be called wonderful counselor look at the next one the mighty god is he not the mighty god and by the way the everlasting father now how can that be if jesus and god the father are different but they are the same. Ask me to explain it, and I will say, give me a million years. Okay? Ask me to believe it. I believe it just like that. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father, and He is the Prince of Peace. So yes, Jesus is the mighty God. God Almighty, the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Galatians chapter 4. Turn there now. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, God always has a fullness of time. God always, God's always about timing. It's not time, it's not time, it's not time, now it's time. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And, and, um, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba. What does that Abba mean? Daddy, Papa. The easiest, easiest words for little tiny mouths to, to phrase. Children don't say father and mother. It's mama, papa, and dada, papa. Because it's easy to say. This is our father, yes, but he is our Abba. And, and again, this idea of can, can Jesus be something else other than the Son of God? Well, if and and 
Can you not believe that Jesus is the Son of God and still go to heaven? I don't know. But if He's going to send His Spirit into you, His Spirit will testify in you that He is the Son of God because you will say, Abba, Father. Uh, and I remember years ago, I, I would, I caught myself, I, I'd listen to myself pray one time and it just seemed like, you know, the Holy Ghost, I guess, was leading me saying, Mike, why don't you ever call Him your Father? You're all the time calling him God. But Mike, he's your father. And from that, from that point on, I, remember when it, I don't remember when it was, but from that point on, I made this conscious effort when I referred to God, he was my only father. And near enough and personal enough to me that even though I addressed him in reverence, even though I approached him in reverence, I still could talk to him like I would talk to my dad. If my dad was here, I would talk to my dad that way. I would ask my dad questions. Dad, this. Dad, does this happen? Dad, how do we do this? Dad, how do you change the rear brakes? And my dad was wise. My dad said, come on over to the house so I can show you how to change the rear brakes. And my dad's version of showing me was, he said, here's the jack and here's the tools. Change them. So I knew what he was getting at. Best way to, for you to learn how to change the rear brakes is to change the rear brakes. Ask me to do it. You can do it. But that's when you, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a Christian, you're gonna call yourself a Christian, but then you say, I don't believe that Jesus was deity. I don't believe he was God. I believe he was close, but I don't believe he was God. Uh, I don't care much for C.S. Lewis, but one thing that C.S. Lewis said that I like was either Jesus was God or he was an evil man. What he meant by that was everybody says Jesus was a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a good, he was a good prophet. He was a, he healed people. He was a good man. Excuse me. He himself claimed to be God. If he's not God, then he's not a good man. He's a fraud and should be exposed as a fraud. And I'm going, okay, that's not bad for a pipe smoking Cambridge intellectual or wherever he was from. Okay. But yes, he is the Son of God. And if you are saved, then. It's not that you have to believe that he's God's son. If you are saved, you believe that he is God's son because you have the spirit of his son in you crying, Abba, Father. Somebody say amen.